greetings friends and welcome to dreams version 2.44 friends in this update we have a whole bunch of new features we've got baking we've got clone live and we've got freaking convert to paint we've got the time gadget we've got all sorts of new tweaks and friends it's honestly just a huge amount so let's get stuck in straight away so keen for this friends glad to have you here whoop whoop dreams community is strong So the first thing we're going to look at is baking. There's been a lot of excitement about this one and I am super keen to get stuck in. So if I wanted to decorate a scene like I've got over here, I've got my sculpt and what I might typically do is grab it and you know copy it a bunch of times. But uh, one problem with this sort of strategy of decorating is that one, it takes a lot of time. Um, if you kind of get lazy and just make a bunch of clones, it might come across as like a little bit too geometric. It doesn't sort of have that random procedurally generated vibe to it. So instead of um, making a whole bunch of copies like we, we do over here, we can use the Bake Emitter tool. Now the way that this works is we have a little object over here, a grabbable object, and inside it I've got just a controller sensor that when I press a particular button it will emit a tree. So instead of placing them all, I'm basically going to shoot them out into the scene. So I'm going to press R3 to make sure we're playing. I'm going to grab it, and then I'm going to press my button to emit a bunch of trees. And basically, the tree logic here is just emitting a tree that when it detects an impact, it emits another tree in its place that is non-movable. So that way you don't have to worry about having too much logic in your scene. Okay, sweet. So now I've placed a whole bunch of trees like this. And I'm also going to place a few like funny ones that might, you know, be stuck a bit in the air. So as you can see, I've got like maybe a few too many here. So what I want to do now to actually bake these into my scene, because as you can see at the moment, if I hover over them, I can't actually interact with any of these ones that I've omitted. This is how it's always been in Dreams. But now what we're going to do is we're going to go to Tools. And then on the right, it's the one with, it looks like the emitter and a piece of bread. Uh, great, great little uh, icon there, by the way. What we're going to do is we're going to go Bake Emitted. And then if there's any that you don't like, what I sort of do is I kind of just delete the ones that I don't like. Um, you can, Or you can just press R2 on all the ones that you do like. But I just delete the ones I don't like and then I'll go Bake All Emitted. And now what we've got, friends, is a scene where all of these which were originally just emitted objects, um, they've all just been thrown down sort of randomly. And you can create a scene which kind of looks like a little bit more randomly placed. Um, it's also a lot easier and a lot faster to do it. And you have just like a totally fabulous scene that's been created in like not even two minutes. Whereas if I had to place all of these individually, it might not look as random and it would take loads longer. So this baking tool is just amazing. I love it. Next up, we have the Clone Liven tool. So let's say we've got a bunch of copies of one particular sculpt, and then we decide, okay, sweet, actually, I want these all to be apple trees. And what we would do is go like, okay, sweet, you know, add some apples into this tree. But the problem is, now you've got all these other trees, and you'd have to be like, okay, sweet, I'm just going to delete this one and move it over there, delete that one, move it over there. And it basically becomes a whole big mission. It takes a whole bunch of time. And if you want to make changes to something that you've made tons of clones of, uh, it's it's just a real headache. But now what you can do is go into Tools and you'll see the Clones icon with the little sheeps. <laughs> Sheep. And then you're going to go into Clone and what you're going to do is press L1 and when you press L1 you'll see all of the sculpts that are actually like clones. So basically it's all the same sculpture data. What you're going to do is then go L1 and Triangle on it and it's going to liven that clone. So now it's become sort of green. Now, if I go into my, my chap over here and I start adding little cherries or little apples, whatever it might be, you're going to see it actually appears on all of the trees around me as well. So let's just get a bit festive, a bit decorative. And now, so all of those clones that I originally made back in the day, now if I want to make any edits to them, it's totally fine. All of these edits are consistent among all the clones. So you basically make them live clones. Uh, not just a clone that kind of is like a static copy of something at a particular time, 
Now they are always the same sculpt. And if you make edits to one of them, you can even make edits to this guy over here. If you decide, okay, sweet. Um, so it's not just like the original one. All of them kind of become combined and become like the same sculpture basically and any edits you make to it get made to all of them and they each remain unique uh, objects that you can move around now we're going to move on to the convert to paint feature so friends uh, anyone who's done a lot of sculpting knows that one of the banes of sculpting is the fact that you can't actually make sculpts transparent or you know opaque in any way you can only do that with paint strokes so if you wanted to make something like glass or something that's transparent you'd use sort of workarounds like you'd paint on an object and do all these sorts of things and people have made awesome stuff with it but now it's made a lot easier and you don't have to for example if you wanted to make a window in the past you might go like okay i'll make it sort of blue um, blue like this and then I'll make it you know metally and maybe a bit shiny and you know all these sorts of all these sorts of things which are like workarounds to make a window and that's pretty cool but now what you can do is go to this object and you'll see on the right you have the convert to painting it's got a little cube and then like a paint stroke so if you do this you will convert the little window that I've got here into a painting now this is cool, but you'll notice that there are like if you go if we go into it, you'll see that it's actually like an empty sort of vessel. They call it a sort of hull in the stream. So it's kind of the shape of the original object, but now turned into paint strokes. And as you can see, there's a few gaps in between. If those gaps kind of bother you and you want it to be like a nice solid object, that's cool. What you can do is go L1 and Square, then go to Flex Properties, and you can go Stretch. And if that still isn't sort of enough for you, you can also increase the looseness on it ever so slightly so that it really fills in those shapes and there aren't like sort of any hectic gaps. Uh, if looseness is too much for you, then maybe just stick with stretch and let's see what happens. So now, as it's a collection of paint strokes, you can very easily just change the opacity. So you can go like over here and you can change it to, who knows, 10% or whatever it might be. Or if that's still not sort of enough, you can just go shwee 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 and adjust that opacity. You can also increase the brightness of it and all these sorts of things. So now you can basically make transparent uh, sculptures when before you couldn't. Uh, because there's no light in this, you can't actually see super well that it is transparent. But if I make this a lot larger and put it like over here, you can see that this works pretty well as a window. And that it is indeed transparent and sort of works nicely as a window. It's nice and transparent there. So anyone who wants to make transparent sculpts now has a much easier workaround for getting that uh, going. And pretty much just making a nice like sculpt that is indeed transparent. Which has been a big problem for us for many, many years. And people have struggled with that a lot. So, yes, that's fabulous, friends. That is the convert to paint uh, feature. If we also use it on just like another object, uh, just for just for some fun, I might uh, put it on smear shape and just go, yoo-hoo. I can do this as well. Just, yeah, convert to paint. As you can see, it creates a little bit of sort of space in between. And um, once again, easy fixes for that is to just go stretch. And in doing that, you sort of reduce the gaps. And you can also increase the looseness ever so slightly so that now you have a paint stroke instead of a sculpture. Um, but it still retains the sort of like physical shape of the sculpture itself. But now it just has um, uh, the, it has all the sort of things that you can do with paint, which is just really awesome. For example, if you wanted to have like a bunch of, you know, buildings in the background or whatever it might be. And you might be like, oh, okay, cool. These are just going to be in the background and I'm going to have a whole city going on. If you have a whole bunch of sculpts, it might actually end up being kind of like use a whole bunch of thermo if you have a whole bunch of sculpts. But if you select a bunch of them and then go convert to paint, this is kind of like if you're doing things in the background, you know what I mean? So this is really good for like background sort of objects and that sort of a thing. Not necessarily everything you do. But it, cre it can create like a bit of a low thermo background that isn't too sort of expensive for your dreams. So that's just another use that they sort of went over in one of the streams. And yes, friends, so that is the convert to paint feature. But friends, the adventures of paint are not yet over. Friends, you know what time it is.
It's quad flick time. We're going to go into paint mode. We're going to go to fleck type. We're going to go all the way to the right and we're going to see the brand new opaque square. So friends, what's great about this one is there's no variation in shape or color. As you can see, I'm zooming all the way in and it's just flat color all the way through. So this is completely unlike every other fleck type. It is uh, just really fabulous. It opens up all sorts of new avenues for like making just like, you know, flat color in dreams. And I just think it's great. What I'm going to do is make another window for this scene and just show you the sort of difference, another option for making like a transparent window. Um, so I'm going to go colors, I'm going to go blue, and I'm going to go into tools and I'm going to actually stamp this fleck. So now friends, now that I've stamped the fleck, I'm going to uh, open the door to let my cat out. Then I'm going to continue with the video. So L1 and Square, uh, or you actually don't even have to go L1 and Square. We're going to go into this object here and just delete this window. Then I'm going to take my new quad fleck and I'm going to put it in place of the window. So it's super like flat color vibes, unlike this chap over here, which is great. So now L1 and Square, and then you can change the opacity of it. And make it like a window so what, what we used to do in the past is use sort of like text displays and all these sorts of things and really this is actually the best way to get like glass um, if, if, if it's like a flat object if you're having a more curvy object this is a really good um, strat but if you've got like um, just like a flat object uh, you can now use instead of like a text displayer you can use uh, a peg square or the quad fleck because it's super flat, uh, flat color, no lo like variation or anything like that. So it's just really perfect for uses like a window and of course all sorts of other paint uses. Um, and what's great about this as opposed to a text display is there's sort of more, f more sort of features that you can do, more sort of functions. So for example, text displayers don't have things like, you know, looseness and stretch, although those don't have a huge sort of effect on the quad flick. Looseness kind of just makes it bigger. Stretch kind of just makes it like longer. Um, because of course generally looseness will like increase the size of the flex but because this fleck is basically um, you know it doesn't really have a lot of uh, what shall we say you know variation in it or any variation at all it sort of reacts slightly differently um, impasto doesn't really do anything because of course it's kind of like a 2d object almost and ruffle kind of just changes the angle of it um, and of course you can do other things like clone which you can't do to a text displayer um, you can do like all sorts of crazy stuff. Wah, hoo -hoo, yeah, hoo -hoo. Um, and basically just have a great time with it there, friends. So this is a super versatile thing, um, especially if you want to make things like transparent objects. Uh, all of those people who've been wanting to make transparent stuff in dreams and have been, you know, stuck with certain paint stro paint objects, paint strokes, and, um, you know, using text displays, there's now way more options, which I just absolutely love. Okay, friends, so now that we've done a little bit of painting and had some fun there, I also want to show you the new adjust detail uh, feature that allows you to change paint strokes. So if we go to tools, we all know about the adjust detail um, feature. If you've got a sculpt, for example, and it's quite red, you can reduce the um, detail of it to lower up on thermo cost, um, but also, of course, you know, reduce the old quality of the old sculpture as well. Before, you couldn't actually do this with paint strokes, but now they've just added it so that you can. So you can see the paint strokes quite blue, which means it doesn't actually have all that many paint strokes. Um, but you can now reduce the amount of paint strokes. That's what adjusting detail does in this context. It reduces the amount of sort of like physical strokes that you have. So now if I exit and I go back, of course, it looks like a lot thinner. So if we go back a whole bunch of times we can see what it originally looked like and we can now reduce it and so on one thing is that you can't actually add detail so if I go over it you'll see it becomes grayed out again and they said that the reason for this is because they don't actually have a way to um, t put the strokes back after you've taken them away so what you have to do is just press back on the old d-pad and you can get it there um, but yes, so you can use the adjust detail to now do paint strokes as well. This is super useful if, for example, you've got, you know, a bunch of like crazy paintings um, that maybe like there's a lot of overlap and there's a whole bunch of like, for example, if I'm doing like a little bit of a cloud here, for example, 
So this one's looking cool. It's nice and fluffy, but maybe it's got quite a few, you know, it's got quite a few paint strokes and because a lot of them overlap, maybe not all of them are useful um, in terms of thermo. So I can just reduce the detail a few times and you still maintain the vibe of the original object. It maybe just becomes a bit smaller. You can of course go totally ham and just like reduce it a whole bunch of times until there's literally just nothing left. But um, where it's like practically useful is that you can actually just, you know, reduce maybe the amount of strokes, save on your thermo, especially if you've got a whole ton of these. So that's a, just a very useful feature that um, we originally had just for sculpts, but now extends to paintings as well, which I think is great. Just going to get rid of that. Next up, friends, I'm going to show you the Luminoise Tweak. So if we go into this uh, sculpture over here, and all sculptures, if you go in very close, you'll see that um, the flex, like the little squares and so on and so forth, or whatever it might be, are, are quite apparent. And this is quite an iconic uh, Dreams look that Dreams has always had. You can also change that. So if I go style mode, I can change that flex type to like the Baroque one, for example. And now you can see it's a slightly different um, sort of, it, it adds texture, you know. So all items, uh, all physical sculpts and dreams have a bit of hue variation. You can see there's different colors here. There's where it's lighter, where it's darker, and so on and so forth. Now what the Luminoise tweak does is we'll go into our sculpture itself. And you'll see at the bottom here, it's got Luminoise. So what we'll do is we will, if we turn this off, it reduces the amount of hue variation but you're going to say me lad bro like i still see some color variation there well friends what we'll do is we'll go to the inner properties and we'll set the color amount to zero and now friends you can see it uh, clear as day that it has basically become flat color now so if you look at for example the door compared to the house because the door still has luminoise on it um, and that inner color you can see that the house has become almost like flat color um, and the door is got the original luminoise and sort of inner color uh, differences. A little bit of that hue variation. So by removing it, we remove the hue variation. The color becomes a lot more solid, a lot more flat. And um, it sort of opens up the artistic realm quite a bit. I know that in the stream they said this was quite a controversial, uh, quite a controversial update. Because the Dreams look was always an iconic one. Um, and so creating something that's a little bit more, uh, you know, solid color and sort of simple. Um, some people I feel like felt there was, it takes a little bit away of the like dreams aesthetic. But um, personally, I still think it's cool because it opens up all the opportunities for people to make things exactly how they look. And giving the creators more control is always awesome if you ask me. But I understand, I understand the sort of uh, the feelings they had as well. Because we all love dreams. Whoop, whoop. So friends, another awesome feature that has come that is going to be useful for optimizing our games in terms of accessibility is um, in the show and hide menu and it's the color blindness filters. So this doesn't actually change the colors that are used in your games, rather it shows you what it would look like from someone's perspective who has a particular kind of color blindness. So there are a few different ones, sort of depending on um, which colors you can't see. And why this is a useful feature for people who aren't colorblind is because it allows us to optimize the colors and the hues of our game so that people with the various kinds of colorblindness can more easily see what's going on. So for example, uh, this tree is red and green, but if you have uh, a kind of color blindness that doesn't allow you to distinguish between those colors very easily, you can see that like, okay, someone, if you had maybe different team colors, that's what they sort of spoke about in the stream, if you needed to have different colors that were quite important, then it might be up to you to say, okay, cool, well then in that case, maybe I'm going to need to use like a slightly uh, a slightly darker color here to show that there is like a distinguishing color here and it's like a different um, it's meant to be different from this one so now if we go back to our filters and we go back to our original we'll see okay sweet it's still red but if I go to color blindness and I have this particular kind, I can see that although the red and the green are like a little bit hard to distinguish, by changing the shade of it, you've actually made it easier for someone to distinguish between them than say the original red and green. 
Similarly, like with other sorts of kinds of color blindness, you can sort of scroll through them and see which ones work, which ones don't work so much. And you can adjust your own games for people who have color blindness. So this feature isn't actually for color blind people so much as it is for the rest of the community being able to make our games more accessible to people with color blindness so that we can adjust the colors slightly in our games so that it's easier for them to use. So I think this is a great a great feature because it allows it allows people to work together to make something that's more accessible um, for all of our dreams users. So I love this feature. So friends, I know that many of us are keen for the old time gadget and you can find it in sensors and input all the way on the right. It's got 14 Feb, which is of course the release date of dreams and uh, of course Valentine's Day. Um, what's cool about this is that you can sort of check what time it is UTC, what the local time is. For me, I can check what the time is in South Africa. And you can also check the session start time. So that's like when you entered a scene or when your player entered a scene um, or when you rewinded it if you're in edit mode. Because then you can do stuff like show people how long they've been playing for. You can set like countdowns to be like, okay, cool, the new update for my game is going to release in so many hours. Um, and it's 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 a really awesome feature, friends. There's all sorts of things you can do with it. Originally, I thought it would be like a time slow or a time stop thing. Um, but unfortunately, it isn't that. But I think these features are really great. And as for a time slow, time stop tutorial, I'm going to be releasing one of those soon. So stay tuned for that. But I want to show you some more features of the time and date uh, gadget, which is very cool. And a lot of them correlate very nicely with the sun and sky gadget. So here we have our time and date gadget on the left, our sun and sky on the right. We're currently on the third page, which is the time properties. And now we can take something like the current date and time, connect it to the set time. And now the sun will be in the position of if it was, I think it's like 10 or 11 at the moment AM uh, in the UTC time zone. Um, and if you go to my local time zone in South Africa, which is a few hours ahead, you can see that the position of the sun is slightly higher. It's closer to sort of midday. And yes, we've also got some nice tweaks over here, which is the sun pitch, which is like how close it is to the horizon. Waha! So the sun can be like basically um, going super, super low to the horizon as it sort of uh, sets and rises. And then we've got Sun Yaw, which is basically the direction in which when the sun is sort of going around the Earth, well, you know, you know, the Earth orbits the sun, you know what I mean. When it looks, appears to be orbiting the Earth, you can choose whether it is setting in the sort of like east and west or whether it sets in the, the uh, north and south, all those sorts of things. So that's what Yaw does. So pitch is how close to the horizon um, your is kind of like which which like cardinal direction the sun sets in. Um, so you can use that to create funky worlds and stuff, you know, alien worlds where the sun sets the other way around and all those sorts of things. Um, so these are awesome features, like super great atmospheric features, because it could be like like when you're playing the game at home, it could be day. And then, um, you know, if you play it another time, but at night, then that can correlate exactly with what it's like in dreams. Um, you can set it to like a the UTC time, so it's not based on their location, but a kind of general one. So every, anyone who plays, it'll be like nighttime at the moment. So everyone who plays, it'll be the middle of the day. Or you can have it set to wherever they are. So I think these are great uh, tools for like immersion and just, I don't know, it gives me like community vibes as well. Because it's like we can all be having the same day or, or living out our own day. And like the game is adjusting itself to our current conditions. I think it's a great feature. It's a great feature. Woohoo! We're going to move on to the animation updates. And the biggest one, or the one that I think is the most major, is the FKIK toggle. So what is the difference between FK and IK? Let's first go over IK. So if I look at my keyframe over here, I've got IK animation on this character's hand. So you can tell it's IK because the sort of striping on the character's body part is a kind of orangey sort of brown color. Now what's cool about IK is that it animates things based on position. So as you can see, my hand here is in a particular position. And if I, for example, move my character's body around, the hand will stay in that position. Woohoohoo! No matter where they move. So it's super useful for animating things like, you know, falling off a ledge and, you know, grabbing on, those sorts of things. And um, what's also good about IK is that it's very low on thermo because you're animating sort of one body part 
and the joints uh, sort of connected to that body part will sort of automatically move based on the way that they're connected to that one that is sort of being animated. So it's a great system. It's like the easiest. It's the one we all, you know, immediately think of when we start animating. We'll just be like, well, I want this hand to be here. So let me just move it where I want it to be. So that's an example of IK. It's low on thermo. It's quick. It's easy. And it sort of locks position. The other kind of animation is FK or forward kinematics. IK stands for inverse kinematics. So with forward kinematics, you aren't animating just the uh, hand, for example. If you wanted to get the same position, you'd go upper arm, then you'd go forearm, and then you'd go hand. You know, I'm just doing a bit of a salute sort of a thing. So with FK, you have a little bit more control. The animation is a little bit smoother, but of course, uh, it's, it's also good for stuff like if you want to do a roll. So now if I do a roll, uh, like a forward flip, back flip, all the body parts will sort of stay tucked in, you know what I'm saying, to the sort of original position. So what's great about FK is uh, it's a little bit smoother, the animation, but of course it's higher on thermo because every element of it uh, that is animated is actually connected to a wire to this particular keyframe, invisible wires. You'll also see that the sort of striping for FK is more green, um, whereas IK is a bit orange. So those are the differences between the two. But now what's the toggle? So if I play my animation over here, then... As you can see, this is a, an example of IK animation. I've just animated the hand. But the character's arm sort of passes through their body because it sort of will move from the, the straight line, the closest point from A to B, the sort of shortest route, as it were. Um, but at the moment, it's looking a little bit janky. It's clipping through the body a bit, not the best. So what we're going to do is we're going to go L1 and X on the keyframe. Then we're going to go to the hand which has got that orange IK sort of striping. And you're going to see on the right here, IK to FK. It's got the little arrow sort of situation going on. So we're going to press that. And then we're going to say stop recording. You'll see immediately that the orange stripes on the hand have become green stripes on the whole sort of shoulder, forearm, and hand. And now if we play, we're going to see a much smoother animation because now it's based on not the position of where the hand was, but all of the rotations that it would take to get the hand to be in that position, including in the in the sort of upper arm, the forearm, and the hand. Like, the logic that goes behind this um, is actually pretty awesome. And I say, like, big hats off to the MM team for uh, making this happen. Big shout out, because it's it's not the, not the simplest thing to implement, but they did a really great job um, and made it so easy for us to do. So this is looking nice and smooth, and I'm also going to show you how to do the opposite. So if you've got um, an FK animation, you're like, this is very smooth, but maybe this is a background character. Maybe I've got tons of animations going on. Let me rather just uh, make it convert it to IK so that it's a little bit lower on the thermo. So what you'll do for that, friends, is you'll go to that keyframe again. You'll go to that hand, and you'll be like, okay, cool, this is an FK animated hand. I now want to make it IK. You just go to the right here. You'll say FK to IK. And then what you'll also do, friends, is you'll see it's become a little bit orange. You'll also deanimate the arm. So you'll press triangle on the upper arm and the forearm. So let's stop recording. Now if I play, it goes back to our original janky IK animation. But, um, of course, it has its own benefits, being based on position and being low on thermo, as opposed to being based on rotation, being a bit smoother, but being a bit more expensive thermo-wise. So it's great that we can now toggle between these um, on our animations. If there's any sections that are particularly like janky or not very smooth in your animations, this will help a lot. And of course, if you've got like maybe a whole bunch of different animations on, uh, it, it uh, could be very useful to convert it to IK. And of course, IK doesn't always look janky. Um, generally with IK, if there's maybe like a few extra keyframes, it can actually sort of smooth it out. But um, now you can easily toggle between them. And I think it's just an awesome feature. Very excited about this one. Whoop whoop. Another very cool animation update is that we're now able to use keyframes to record movement or repositioning of widgets. So when I talk about a widget, I mean like, for example, this mover. And when we look at the mover, we can see this white thing that has the X, Y, and Z. So originally we couldn't actually control these using a keyframe 
we would just have to position them at the beginning of our sort of usage of this particular tool. But now, keyframes, for example, if I go here, I can, and I open my mover at the same time, I can change it so that the X direction is, or in other words, like where you're going to be moving, where forward is, is now left. And if I look here on this keyframe, forward is now to the right. So what's the use of this, friends, and what have I set up over here? So what I've done over here is I've connected a splitter to the left stick local. And by connecting it to the left stick local, it basically catches what direction is the left stick currently pointing based on, um, based on how I'm holding the controller. So even if the character is looking to the left and I press left, they aren't going to you know, go in a weird direction. So that's why we use the left stick local. I've used a splitter to separate between the X and Y, in other words, the up and down. Or oh, sorry, not the up and down, but the like horizontal and vertical movement. And then I split it again to differentiate between left and right and uh, backwards and forwards. So what's great about this is that I can now do a directional dash uh, very easily. So I've just got a very simple animation where my character sort of jumps in the air. And then I've got a mover for literally just a like split second. And what's basically uh, different here is that I use these keyframes over here to change the direction that I'm going to be moving. So with just a few splitters and keyframes, I can now jump forward, I can jump to the left, I can jump to the right, I can jump backwards, I can do like basically I can do diagonal as well. So what's great about this friends is that I've basically now developed a directional dash, which was sometimes like a bit of a pain before you had to do all sorts of things. But now you can, with just the use of a splitter and these sort of um, few keyframes, you can now just directly adjust the widget as you're sort of playing. And so as I move my left analog around, it's actually changing the direction of the widget um, just like that. And you can go literally in a 360 um, just from having this simple system. So being able to change things like these widgets is great. I know that another uh, possible use they described was like, you could change the size of a trigger zone when your enemies have, you know, detected you, for example. Um, so something like a trigger zone, for example, that also uses a widget, um, even though it's not a moves and output, you know what I mean? Trigger zone, you can select a, a, a keyframe, go into that trigger zone, and now you can control this white bit over here and make it larger, uh, which is pretty epic. It doesn't actually show up on the widget, it's more like on the tool itself. You can see here are the old lines of animation. Um, so those are that's another sort of uh, animation feature that's been added, uh, which I'm very excited about, especially because you can do a directional dash just like that. Oh, and this keyframe over here just prevents sort of movement and increases uh, deceleration speed, in case you're wondering. But yes, friends, so that's the, uh, the next uh, animation update, which was very useful. Okay, friends, now I'm going to show you a few more uh, logic additions that have been made in this update, which are all very cool, a lot of them very mathsy. But um, so we've got our original calculator over here in logic and processing. And if we go into it, we'll see some awesome new features, which is the greater than or equal to or the less than or equal to, which is so useful because Dreams has always had the greater than or less than. Um, but you'd always have to be like, if you wanted to have a number like 10, You'd have to be like, oh, it has to be greater than, or if you wanted something more than 10, you'd have to be like, oh, it's greater than 9.9. .9. Um, or if you wanted to be like, oh, it has to be less than 10, then you'd be like, okay, the number has to be, you know, less than 10.1 or something like that. So there were workarounds, but now that we've just got the greater than or equal to signs, you can be like greater than or equal to 10, blah, 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 and so on and so forth. Um, so I just find these these little additions very useful. Then we've got trigonometric functions. I was absolutely terrible at trig in school, so I can't tell you anything about this. <laughs> but I know that these are super useful, especially for the math the math kids out there. They're going to start doing crazy things. And then we've got vectors. Um, personally, I'm not like hugely uh, much better at vectors than I am at trig. Um, but I know that you can do things like calculate ricochets and all these sorts of things um, with these vectors. So I'll leave this up to the math geniuses. Next up, we've got a wide calculator, and if you put it down, it kind of looks the same. But what's cool about this one is that it actually has 10 ports. 
So you can add or minus or times um, or divide or find minimum and max values um, of up to 10 different inputs, which is great because of course with the original calculator you can only have an A and a B. Now you can have an A to a J and of course you'll have your results also at the bottom. Um, the reason that uh, they mentioned there's sort of fewer uh, calculations that can go on. So for of course our original calculator, we've got tons of different features and for the wide calculator you've only got like five or six. Um, well the main reason is because most of these aren't actually appropriate to a having more than you know an A and a B. You know, So for example, if you needed to round off or like round down to or find the absolute value or greater than or equal to like ooh, greater than or equal to 10 different values ooh, so it doesn't sort of make sense exactly um, and of course like something like equals as well doesn't really make any sense because you'll be like does a equal b equal c equal d equal e you know what i'm saying so all of these features um, are sort of contained in the a and b where there's only just sort of two values but the wide calculator can use all sorts of different ones and you can make it nice and long just like that and it is indeed the wide calculator and it is a very pretty boy we love that uh, next up friends you'll you'll see that uh, in the old uh, calculator as well the original one and the wide calculator we have then this new sort of results tab which is super great because um, let's say we added in some values let me take for example just a value slider I'm just gonna put those down and I'll be like okay sweet I'm gonna have 0 0.4 and 0 0.6 or 0 0.8 let's say and now if I wanted to uh, find out what this value was, you'd pretty much have to before be like, okay, sweet, so it's 0 0.4 plus 0 0.8, cool. So I know that's going to be equal to 1.2 in your brain. But if you wanted to see what it would actually look like, you'd have to connect it to an output and so on and so forth. But now, of course, we can just see it at the bottom, uh, which is just a, a very small tweak, friends. Um, and I believe they used to have it in Dreams back in the day, but it, there was a little bit of jankiness and stuff, or it wouldn't display numbers correctly. But now this is a very polished version, and um, now you can just see what those what that value is before you like need to plug it into anything. So personally, I find this a really great feature, especially for all the logic heads who are going to be using tons of numbers and stuff, especially with the new trigonometric and vector functions, which are just fab. So I think this is a lovely just quality of life update, and um, I know that the math kids are going to be loving this very much. Oh, boo boo. Okay friends, it's time to look at some of the new music features that have been added to this update and there are quite a few. So the first one we're going to look at is the down sampler. I've just got a simple track here, uh, Funky Steps beat. Um, it's just, you know, some nice percussion vibes. So I'm going to go to distortion and check out the old down sampler. So I'm going to turn distortion on, go all the way to the top left so we're at bit, bit crusher, and now we've got the down sampler. Now by increasing this, you'll see that we immediately get more of those sort of 8-bit lo-fi vibes. You can also go L1 and X so that it actually varies in the amount of downsampling that is done. So you can just take like a very classic sort of beat and then add it onto this and it just gives it some very cool lo-fi 8-bit vibes. And personally I think this is so cool. Um, if you want to like basically just change the whole face of your music and what it sounds like and feels like you can now use this down sampler and it, it, I feel like it just adds a little bit of um, versatility and ease to making sort of lo-fi music um, or even like old-school video game music if there's any pixel pixely 8-bit vibes out there this is a great tool for you Woohoo! okay friends so I think we're gonna use our original music as well so here's our down sampled percussion now I've got a bit of piano, and what I'm going to show you now is the octave jitter, or also known as random octave jump, octave octave. So I'm going to turn on granular randomization, and then over here is where we've got octave jitter. So I'm going to increase that, and now it's basically a chance for it to go up by uh, a number of octaves. I think they said it was 24, but I mean that's not octaves. Um, but yeah, so basically for each note, there's a chance that it can go an octave higher than its original note. 
and then you get this like totally fabulous like spacey vibe um, I think it sounds super cool like very much sci-fi vibes very much being in space or you know even like an enchanted forest I think it's it's really cool so here it is in get granular randomization halfway down octave jitter awesome feature let's keep it moving friends so I've just added some violins now I'm going to go to pitch and show you the new transpose feature. So originally you could have coarse and fine um, sort of granular increases to pitch, but it kind of just increases the pitch. Now with the transpose you can actually be changing the notes. So you're basically like increasing all of the notes by one. So you can actually like have a lot more control over like the musical notes that are being played. So instead of a B, you're going to be playing a C, you know. So all the Bs will become Cs, all the Cs will become Ds, that sort of a thing. Um, rather than just changing the pitch of the sound and and sort of getting you these sort of strange additions. Of course, this can go up and it can go down, uh, which is pretty awesome because um, if you want to have a little bit more control, you now can. So there you are friends, those are some of the new music features, yoo hoo hoo! Okay friends, so the next feature that we're going to look at is legato, which is also located in the pitch section. So here I've got a little, some notes over here, so let's give it a listen. So I've kind of just got four punchy notes on the piano there, um, and so at the moment it's kind of just when one note ends, the next one begins quite abruptly. And legato is basically the ability to add like a bit of a slide between different notes. So let's listen to it originally. And now let's listen when we've got legato on. This is when it's always on. So as you can hear, it gets like a little bit softer and it also sort of transitions well between those notes. It's like a little bit of a, a little bit of a smooth situation. If we've got it on while gated, Gated basically makes it so that it'll only work if they're actually next to each other. So, for example, so these ones, it works the same, but if I were to draw a note that was over here, it would sort of start its own, its own little story. So as you can hear over there, that section, because it's not gated, in other words, it's not connected to another note at all, it sort of starts as a new abrupt note, but the one that is gated to it over here is going to have that nice legato, that nice slide down. Um, so let's play them all together and see what happens. It might sound awful, but... I should probably leave this. That would probably be pretty cool. And as you can see, actually, because I looped these, the legato actually continues, so by the time after it sort of like fades through, by this point you can barely hear the note. So the longer the sort of like chain of legato in those notes, the sort of uh, softer it gets, which is something else to keep in mind. But there you go friends, um, you took a, like a really mediocre musician like me and I'm already sounding way funkier now that we've got this, um, now that we've got this situation going on. It's pretty awesome friends, there are more features for all the music lovers out there. If you enjoy singing in dreams, in the past it was a little bit tricky to sync things up because the sound recorder wouldn't actually count in like other instruments when performing them. So now you can put the count in on and when you put your sound recorder, in other words, you know, where your singing is going to go, it'll actually do a bit of a count in so you can get ready. So let's give this a bit of a try. 2.44 dreams, 2.44 so, <laughs> I've just added a little bit of singing. 2.44 dreams, 2.44. So that was a lot of fun. 2.44. 2.44 dreams, 2.44. And as you can hear, like literally, it didn't require any fanciness, any moving around or whatever it was. I literally just, um, yeah, put the music in, uh, put the sound recorder in, recorded it. And now it's just at the perfect time and it's, you know, 2.44 linked dreams, perfectly with the music. Of course, you have to actually be able to sing to do that. Whether I can actually sing is, uh, that's a conversation for the comments. 
But what's great about this is now you can also be adding like, you know, you can be adding layers of music on, so, you know. 2.44 dreams, 2.44 dreams, 2.44 <laughs> dreams 2.4 oh, okay sorry that wasn't so great let me try that again so let's go 4 4 dreams 2.44 so you can add last nice nice to layers 2.44 dreams 2.44 2.44 dreams 2.44 4 4 dreams 2.44 so as you can see here, friends, you can really add layers of music and add your own singing to it. Whether that singing is any good or not is another question. But you can do it in dreams now. <laughs> music is the best. Really enjoying these new music features, especially. Woo! Okay, friends, another feature that I want to show you is the camera blocker tweak. So, at the moment, when you go into your puppet... Uh, at the moment, the camera blocker is set at dynamic. So, sort of, depending on where you are, the uh, camera will be sort of blocked, um, or you'll be able to pass through it sort of based on the position of the puppet and of the particular situation. Now, the way that we adjust whether the camera is blocked or not is we'll go to this particular sculpture that we have, then we're going to go to collision labels, and by default, the camera blocking mode is on dynamic. So if you want the camera to always be blocked, then you'll put it on always over here. And that way, if I'm going into an area that's small and we want to give kind of those claustrophobic vibes, you'll set it to always, and the camera basically can't escape the, like, sculpture, you know, because the camera will be blocked by that sculpture. But if you come outside, you'll go back to your normal view. Once you're inside, it'll sort of be reduced in size. Which is great if you're sort of traveling between various little areas. It just makes your camera a bit more sort of useful. Um, if you want to have the opposite and be like, nah, I want my character to always be able to see what's going on. Then you'll set camera blocking mode to never. That way, if you go into your character and you sort of look around, you'll always have your sort of your view. And even if you're sort of, even if you'll move through an object... It'll sort of just add a little bit of like a colored vignette based on the kind of uh, object that you're moving through. So you kind of just move through that particular object. So those are the three sort of features of uh, the camera blocking. And the feature isn't in any camera settings. It's actually in the sculpts themselves. It's in their collision page. And you'll just choose between dynamic, never, and always. Alrighty. And friends, there we have it. These are all of the updates that I could manage to go over. There are a few more here and there, a few more tweaks, so on and so forth, um, that I didn't cover in the video. But uh, friends, do let me know what you think of this update. I think it's honestly a massive, massive game changer. Um, and I just cannot wait to see all the things that people have made. I've already seen some of the things on Twitter that people have made, and it's just totally amazing, like with the square fleck and so on and so forth. Um, but yeah, friends, get stuck in with the logic, with the maths, with the music, with the art, with the sculptures, with the painting. There's so much more that you can do and so much more that you can do with the things that you originally couldn't. So it's all just completely expanded upon and it's just amazing. I'm so, I feel so lucky to be able to be part of such a great community and, you know, to have awesome devs like MM still releasing things to this day, like two plus years after the release of the game, after release of the version 1.0. And yeah, I just feel very, very lucky. I hope you enjoyed this video, friends, and I shall catch you on the flip flop. Peace out.